This is part one of the obstetrics talks, and it's going to focus on pregnancy in terms of diagnosis, some definitions, and also dating. Starting out with diagnosis, this really depends on detecting beta HCG. So understand this is good to know a little about the physiology of um, beta HCG. How does it work? So it starts to be produced about six days after ovulation. So you have, and that's in the setting of fertilization of pregnancy. So you have ovulation, fertilization, the pregnancy. Um, starts to develop and you have beta HCG production. So that's the earliest that you could um, detect it. Where it's produced is from these trophoblast cells as you can see here in the blastocyst. So these trophoblast cells start producing, producing beta HCG and that's important in uh, general physiology because the corpus luteum needs a signal to say hey there's a pregnancy going on I need to produce progesterone and estrogen. So after fertilization and the trophoblasts start producing beta HCG that signal will go to the corpus luteum signal it to produce estrogen and progesterone and that's necessary for uh, continuing on um, the pregnancy. And as you can see here, beta HCG rapidly increases, doubling every roughly two days for about 10 weeks and it reaches a peak of around 100,000. That's around 10 to 12 weeks and that's the same time that the placenta um, gets the responsibility to make the progester progesterone and the estrogen handed off from the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will stop um, with those functions, the placenta will start in around 10 or 12 weeks at the end of the first trimester. And you can see beta HCG then um, decreases and kind of plateaus around 30,000 here at the end. The way to test for beta HCG, there's two ways. So there's serum and urine. Uh, the serum gives you a quantitative or a qualitative uh, reading. Quantitative is usually what you'd get, and that, that gives you a number, so you can tell how much beta HCG there is. And that's important, for example, for things like following ectopic pregnancy. You don't just want to know is it there or not. You, know, you already know that it's there. You want to see how it's changed over time and what the, what the value is. And then the urine, that's the, the base of the home. Um, pregnancy tests, and that's a qualitative yes, no, it's detecting beta um, CG. By the time someone's noticed that their period hasn't come, that would be roughly um, two weeks after ovulation fertilization, so the, the, the home test, uh, the urine test should be positive by then. The threshold for the detection on the serum test is lower than the urine, so you can have the situation where you have a positive uh, serum test with a, with a negative urine test, and then in that case you'd go with the results of the serum test being been positive. This picture here also with the beta HCG reduction shows that you have these trophoblasts in the blastocyst and that's going to implant in the endometrium, right? And then the trophoblast is going to differentiate into two different layers. And so it's going to have a cytotrophoblast, the inner layer, and then the syncytial trophoblast, the outer layer. And the syncytial trophoblast will be, will be what produces um, beta HCG going forward. So part two of diagnosis is you don't just want to know that there is beta HCG, yes or no, and there is a, some sort of a pregnancy. You want to know is this a viable pregnancy? Is it intrauterine? Can you get a fetal heart rate and things like that? And so uh, to do that, you, do, you can do different tests at different times and, um, to find out more information. So the initial, the earliest thing you can do with a beta HCG, HCG value about 1,500 around five weeks, you should be able to do a transvaginal ultrasound and see if the pregnancy is viable in intrauterine. The following week, the beta HCG will be increased about 5,000. it will be week six, and if you do a transvaginal ultrasound, you should be able to see a fetal heart rate by then. And then using a portable Doppler, that's a typical thing that you'd use in the office setting. At about 10 weeks, the beta HCG will be about 100,000. That's its peak value. And then you can see uh, the heart rate and also there's intrauterine pregnancy. And all these values given here are the earliest that you can detect these things within a range. Figuring out dating, beta HCG is not helpful for this. You might think with the uh, graph we showed earlier, that stereotypic rise in the HCG um, amount and then plateauing and then declining, that you could use that for dating. But you can't. There's too much variability between people. So there's but there are two ways that you can um, figure out dating. So one is the last menstrual period, and the other is the ultrasound. So the last menstrual period is you just go from the time that the person remembers they had their last menstrual period to when they are now. So that was 10 weeks ago, then they're at 10 weeks. It was 20 weeks ago, 20 weeks. And that gives you the gestational age, the GA. And that's different than developmental age. Developmental age is, to me, what's intuitive when you think about how old um, something is. So if it's from fertilization to now has been 10 weeks, the developmental age would be 10 weeks as the actual age. And as you can imagine, the um, gestational age and the developmental age are about two weeks apart. Just carrying on our example here. So let's say we have the last menstrual period here. We continue on for two weeks. We have um, ovulation, fertilization. And we go, let's just go for another ten weeks to use our same, our same numbers. So if we're doing just if we're doing doing the gestational age based on the last menstrual period, we'd have twelve weeks. And that's the total time. Two weeks. From the last menstrual period to ovulation and fertilization, another 10 weeks to where we are now. This is now. Um, and that's 10 weeks for the gestational age. But if you're looking at the developmental age, or the way I think about it as the actual age, then that would be 10 weeks, right? Because that's going from the time of the fertilization when the, when the um, 
uh, pregnancy started until now, so that's only 10 weeks. All right, so that's the difference there. And figuring out the um, dating is is very important. So if you have a good story for last menstrual period, that's that can be a good way to do it. Ultrasound early on in a pregnancy is, is the best way to do it. And you need one of these to establish um, the age, because as you can see over here, just deciding where you are, are you pre-viable, pre-term, term, or post-term, it's all termed by gestational age. So it's really important to figure this out because it's going to have or could have big consequences um, later on down the down the road. An ultrasound early on is is more accurate than it is later on. So it's important at the initial visit or one of the first few visits to figure out um, the age. So for example, let's say here you thought you were 39 weeks, but you really were three weeks off, and you're actually 42. Well, that could change your management because now you're in a post-term situation from term. And also, you can, as you can imagine down here, um, pre-viable or pre-term at 24 weeks, it could totally um, change the way, um, change your management. So measuring the funnel height, that's another way um, f to do dating. But you want that you want to try to do that after you've already established um, an age. So let's say you've used ultrasound in the last menstrual period. You have your your age, and then you the person comes into the office. You can measure the funnel height. So that's from the pubic symphysis up to the top of the uterine fundus. So you just palpate to find the top of the, of the uterus, measure down the pubic symphysis. You get a number in, in centimeters. So this works after um, about 12 weeks. So after about 12 centimeters up, you can start using this. So let's say you get a value of 20, um, 22 centimeters. So that should uh, correspond to 22 weeks. And you can use this uh, to compare. So let's say by um, ultrasound, you, you, you thought that you should be 26 weeks. And then the person comes in your office and you measure 22 weeks, then you'd say, okay, that's the problem. If there's a four week discrepancy here, and that could clue you in to, to look for um, some sort of a problem. So, uh, recording the G's and P's, this is the last part of this definitional intro talk. So, G's is gravity times uh, having been pregnant, P is party. So, if the pregnancies have um, gone past 20 weeks, so for example, it's going to be G2, P1. And as you can see from this example, it kind of leaves you hanging you're like what what's really going on it doesn't give a lot of descriptive information so that's why you break up the p term into four different values so the first one is term then preterm abortion miscarriage and living so those are living children so those are the four values so you have g4 been pregnant four times p1 one kid born at term two preterms one abortion um, stroke miscarriage and then three as the living kids so how the math works out um, for this, you can see the term, preterm, abortion, miscarriage, all those should combine to equal the G number, so G4. Those should add up to that. And the exception to that being if the person is pregnant now. So let's say someone's pregnant now, then they would be, um, they're coming in to see you, there'd be G5, and we can keep the P's the same, so they're P, um, P1, 2, 1. So you'd say, okay, what, what about the fifth one? Then you'd say, well, they're G5, uh, P4, and they're at uh, 32 weeks. So that explains what happens to the to the fifth one. And then also to keep in mind, these, this is talking about pregnancies, um, not number of fetuses. So Octomom isn't because she had um, eight fetuses at once and eight kids at once. So she's not G8 because of that. She's that's G1. She, G1. She was pregnant once. You could imagine the same thing um, with twins. And so here is just some more um, naming and terminology. You can put nully, zero, preemie, one, or multi in front of um, gravid or, or parse to, um, to make it work to describe um, number of times being pregnant or, par or parity. So multi, paris, or nully, gravid, examples of that. All right, so that's the end of this um, introductory talk about some of these definitions on our topic. So thanks for watching. You can visit ProcedureReady.com for more. Um, videos like this, you can always download the PowerPoint or use any of these images or things like that and anything you want to create for education or whatever, any use, um, just try to keep the ProcedureReady.com logo on it. And if um, you have time, consider visiting 